right, guys, Dr. Ash here uh, coming to you in this video in regards to antepartum and pregnancy. And so what we're actually going to talk about in this short video is going to be our normal antepartum phases, alternative therapies and their use during pregnancy, as well as substance abuse during pregnancy and some of the outcomes that happen because of that. So let's talk about normal antepartum first. So antepartum really just means before birth. This is a gestational or pregnancy period that lasts approximately 48 weeks or 40 weeks or 280 days. And I like to put progesterone in here because progesterone is the primary hormone of pregnancy. And so I like to remember it as pro-gestation or pro-pregnancy. So progesterone, number one hormone of pregnancy. Now, one of the things that we wanna do, of course, remember I like to come from a down and dirty, very quick. What do I need to know for NCLEX and for nursing concepts? And so one of the things that I want you to remember is that we can actually do some non-evasive evaluations of development and growth during the pregnant woman. Again, this is from the perspective of the nurse. So these are things that nurses can do. Yes, there are other things, but we can't do those without a doctor's order. So remember, this is what we're going to focus on. And so the fundal height is one of these ways that we can non-evasively evaluate the development of the pregnancy. And so we have some kind of milestones, if you will. So about halfway during the pregnancy, approximately 20 weeks, that fundus, which is the top of the uterus, can be found around the belly button or umbilicus. And this is going to be off or can be off by one to two or plus or minus two centimeters, which is off by about two weeks. So it can either be about 22 or 18, but roughly at 20 weeks, the uh, fundus is gonna be at the umbilicus or umbilicus or belly button or whatever you wanna call it. The other thing that I want you to remember is that prenatal visits are gonna happen about every four, four weeks in the first trimester, second trimester, um, they can be about every two to three weeks. And then in the last trimester, um, or sorry, actually the last month of development, last month of development, it's going to be every week. But just remember in that first one to two trimesters, they're going to be about every four weeks. The other thing I want to kind of remind my patients as we were talking about screening and what we can expect in the antepartum period is that fetal movement is going to start at about 16 to 20 weeks. And there are something called Braxton Hicks contractions, which are very painless contractions that tend to go away at rest. So when the pregnant woman is up and active, she may feel a Braxton Hicks contraction, one or two, just very random contractions. But once she sits down, those should resolve. And those started about 16 to 18 weeks. Um, in our prenatal visits, there are some things that are going to happen every single time they go to the prenatal visit. And there are some things that are going to happen just kind of at the first visit or maybe if there are some issues going on. And so one of the things that you're going to see every single time is a weight check and nutritional education. And so we monitor the weight because on average, now this changes whether you're a little fluffy or whether you're a little skinny or tiny, smaller bone frame, just depends on where you're at before you get pregnant. But as a good estimate, we are expected to gain about 25 to 35 pounds. Of course, the smaller individual, they'd be closer to the 35, 40 pounds. A larger individual, we're kind of on the smaller end of the 20 to 25 pounds. Either way, the majority of the weight gain is going to happen in the third trimester. And that's because the baby at that point, all the critical development has kind of happened. And it's more focused on finishing up those big organs and then gaining weight. And so the majority of the weight gain is going to happen in the third trimester. Now for calories, there's a couple of things you want to think about. As a rule, the general female should be taking in about 1500 calories a day. Well, that's going to increase about three to 400 during each trimester. So trimester one, we would recommend about 1800 calories. Trimester two, anywhere from um, 21 to 2200. And then the third trimester up to 2400 calories. So approximately three to 400 each trimester. And then of course, we wanna make sure that our patients are either getting folic acid supplements and calcium supplements or taking folic acid rich or calcium rich foods because we are growing an individual. Folic acid is needed for neurodevelopment, the brain, uh, the spinal cord, prevent neural tube defects, cleft lip, cleft palate. And then of course, calcium is important because we're growing bones and muscles and tissues. And so that uh, growing fetus needs those intake. So again, that can either be in the form of supplementation or in the form of food items. 
uh, your analysis. So your analysis is going to happen at every single wellness check. And that's because we're checking for blood, ketones, glucose, and protein. We're checking for blood or white blood cells in case there's an infection. We're checking for ketones in case they are dehydrated or in a starvation state. We're checking for glucose in case um, they have diabetes. We're checking for protein in case they are having issues with high blood pressure. So lots of different things that we can tell just by the urine and that's gonna happen at every single check. Now at the first prenatal visit, and that can happen from you know, first missed period up to a couple of weeks in, like, you know, 12 weeks in, et cetera, just really depends on when the woman finds out and when there's availability, but somewhere in that first kind of trimester, they want to see you at least one time. Um, and so what they do at the first check are going to be things like blood typing, a baseline uh, blood count for hemoglobin and hematocrit. They're going to be looking for your hep B status. They're going to be looking for a sickle cell screening in some cases, uh, checking for STIs to see if you've had some sort of exposure to um, a herpes or HIV or syphilis or any of those other STIs that we talk about in a different video. So all those are gonna be things that we screen for at the first visit. Now, another thing that's gonna come into play for prenatal visits at some point are gonna be ultrasounds. And the reason why I say some point is because high-risk pregnancies tend to have earlier ultrasounds, low-risk pregnancies tend to have later on in the pregnancy for anatomy and structural checks. And so early on, I would probably say the first 12 weeks, um, maybe a little bit sooner, maybe the first nine to 10 weeks. But anyways, in those first kind of weeks of pregnancy, the best way to assess uh, fetal heart tones is going to be through a transvaginal. And so that's a probe that actually gets inserted into the vagina to assess for heart tones. But then after that, they do abdominal ultrasounds. And this really checks for if there's any defects, any heart defects, any, you know, if they have off hands and uh, feet and legs and arms and all those fun things. So anatomy and structural checks for anomalies. Now, some very uncommon or non-routine testing would be things like DNA screening, alpha fetal protein blood testing, amniocentesis, um, and biophysical profiles. There's a couple of different other ones that are not as important. Just understand these are going to require uh, consent because they're invasive. These are going to be our high-risk pregnancies that we're worried about something or simply the family can just ask for them, but they're not done routinely. Um, you know, another part of being a nurse is kind of understanding what red flags are. And so we really have to identify things that might be in the history or might be uh, that the patient is exposed to. Any, at any rate, we're gonna try to find those high risk that says, I need further testing. I need to follow up on this, or I need to look for other things. And so risk factors in the maternal or family history. This will be things like past obstetrical history, such as preterm births, miscarriages, uh, fetal demises, uh, anything within the birth history that gives us kind of like a, a red flag that we need to follow up on. Because what we find is that when you have a history of preterm birth, you're more likely to have future preterm birth. So we have to be careful of that. Certain medications, so psychiatric meds, we do have more and more um, population on anti-anxiety, anti-depression, um, mood stabilizers, different various psychiatric medications. And of course, they require strict follow-up, including with psychiatry, because some of them can have birth defects. Some of them shouldn't be stopped until the third trimester. They just have all different kinds of regulations. And it's not important that you understand what each medication has with each kind of pregnancy regulation, so much as you recognize that's a red flag. We need to follow up on that. So more important that you understand that is something to look for versus exactly what it does. And then NSAIDs and blood thinners, of course, we can't have a viable pregnancy without uh, or with these medications. They put them at higher risk for hemorrhage, for miscarriages and all sorts of other things. So those are some red flags. Um, abnormal elevated vital signs, even though you're in a pregnancy state, it's a normal physiological state. And so there really shouldn't be abnormalities um, in vital signs, including blood pressure. Most people think because we have high circulating volume, we should have high blood pressure, but really the body does a good job of regulating that. 
So the red flag for that would be a systolic greater than 130. So anything greater than 130, we would want to follow up on because we do not take hypertension in pregnancy lightly. And there actually be a separate video on pregnancy and hypertension because there are so many things that come with it. Um, and then a family history. Do we have the family history of sickle cell? Do we have a family history of any chromosomal abnormalities that would cause for DNA or genetic testing? So some common discomforts. Remember I mentioned we have some common physical things that happen such as increased blood volume. We have um, you know, a stress on the immune system, on the endocrine system. Everything kind of starts to work double. And so there's some common discomforts that come along with pregnancy. The important thing is to understand what's common versus what we need to follow up on. Okay, so the nurse's role, what's common in pregnancy versus I got, this is a red flag, I got to do something about it. So psychological women can have ambivalence, they can have mood swings, they can be perfectly happy pregnant, they can be kind of all over the place and that's normal. Nausea, vomiting, urinary frequency and urgency, breast tenderness, increase in vaginal discharge or vaginal mucus, tired, heartburn, swelling, backaches, headaches. These are all okay. These are all things that happen. The problem is, can we identify when things become a complication? Um, and we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. So medications, all of them, doesn't matter what it is, should be cleared with a provider no matter what. Um, normally drugs that are harmless to us in a pre-pregnancy state can now become very harmful to that fetus or that developing baby. And so we have to be very, very careful. All medications need to be cleared with the provider. And then of course, I talked about this already and that psychiatric meds, they require close, close follow-up. Now let's talk about signs of potential complications. And so it's very important as a nurse, as a nursing student for you to understand that these are my red flags, okay? Um, whether you have an L&D rotation, whether or not you have it in simulation, these are your like, oh my gods, okay? So a dizziness or a drop in blood pressure could be supine hypertension. That comes from laying on your back or a female laying on their back and the weight of the fetus and the uterus compress the inferior vena cava, causes a drop in blood pressure. You turn them on their side, it should get better. Weight loss or lack of weight gain can cause intrauterine growth restriction. So we need nutrition to be involved. Vomiting to the point of electrolyte and fluid disturbances called hyperemesis gravidarum, dry carbohydrates. Don't eat within 30 minutes of getting up. Don't brush your teeth within 30 minutes of getting up. Just some common sense kinds of things. Fever, chills, back pain, or flank pain could be a kidney infection or kidney stones. We have to treat those immediately. Hydration is important. Uh, lack of fetal movement or a decrease in fetal movement could be fetal demise or miscarriage. So we need to evaluate that female immediately. Visual changes, facial or hand swelling, in addition to a headache, could be hypertension or preeclampsia, as it used to be called. Again, that will be like a whole nother video because there's lots of follow-up and monitoring and things that we need to watch for. Uh, urine, uh, glucose in the urine could be gestational diabetes requiring glucose tolerance testing. A sudden vaginal discharge could be either premature labor or premature rupture of membranes. And our intervention here is really gonna depend on gestational age. If they're 37 weeks or 36 weeks, we can probably have a delivery no problem versus if they're 20 weeks, we're going to have a little bit different uh, intervention for that. Lower abdominal pain, cramping, shoulder pain could be an ectopic pregnancy, could be a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. So we want to assess for signs of shock. And the common drug here is going to be methotrexate. Methotrexate actually uh, decreases cellular production in the fetus. And so it keeps that ectopic pregnancy from growing until we can go in and do a surgical removal. So a little bit about alternative medicines in pregnancy. They are just the same as medications, okay? We know that alternative therapies tend to be individually unique. They promote health. Um, it's something that the patient can control. So they typically like to do it, but there are some problems because we cannot just go doing research on maternity patients, right? It's unethical to do research 
um, on things that could potentially do harm to the mother and a fetus. And so there are a lot of therapeutic remedies that are not studied, like magnetic therapy. It's contraindicated because we don't know the harmful effects. While some things like guided imagery or meditation or prenatal massages, those tend to be safe because they don't induce pregnancy. They don't cause harm to the fetus. Um, there is one very specific herb or alternative over-the-counter remedy, and that's feverfew. So a lot of people will use that for headaches, but it has been directly linked to miscarriage. Um, so that is a big no-no during pregnancy. So those are just some points to consider. The last thing we'll wrap up here is with substance abuse during pregnancy. So again, just like the CAM, just like medications, they're typically not safe. So illicit drugs are not safe either. Um, our top ones here, and I just wanna show you the top ones because they're not all illicit. Some things are legal, alcohol and cigarettes. Those are legal. I can go into the store and buy those at any time. Um, but cocaine has an increase of birth defects and miscarriage. Amphetamines increase the risk of IUGR, that intrauterine growth restriction, again, because it causes vasoconstriction and it's a stimulant. Alcohol impairs development, mental impairment, has all kinds of uh, outcomes associated with alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome. And then cigarette smoking is the number one cause of IUGR, again, due to vasoconstriction. So cocaine, methamphetamines, alcohol, and cigarettes are going to be your kind of common substances that the NCLEX nursing tests will ask you about, certain scenarios might ask you about. Um, women who have addiction problems can be transitioned over to methadone. Methadone treatment plans have actually been determined safer in pregnancy. I hate to say completely safe, uh, but, you know, opioid versus methadone, opioids are a little bit harder, oxycodone, Percocet, fentanyls, those are a little bit worse than methadone. Methadone is still opioid based, but it's not as strong. And so we tend to see less ill effects on the fetus after a methadone program. All substances, whether it's methadone, whether it's cocaine, whether it's cigarettes, they all come with the risk of birth defects as well as addiction. So these babies can be born addicted to certain substances including alcohol and cigarettes and caffeine, but we don't, we're not going there with caffeine today. So a couple of different things that we want to notice, and I think this is it. Yep, this will be the last slide, is that we have issues with withdrawal. So these babies are born addicted and they actually have withdrawal symptoms. So common signs and symptoms would be tremors, irritability, diarrhea, projectile vomiting, poor feeding, poor growth, uh, very rigid and um, hypertonicity. So in other words, their muscles are contracted and they're very like stiff. Uh, nasal congestion or stuffiness and tachypnea, they do tend to breathe fast. This is not that much different from an adult withdrawal, okay? This just happens to be very, very sad because these babies have a hard time being comforted, a hard time um, being consoled. And so what we find is that treatment with swaddling and snuggling, so that tight swaddle makes them feel very comfortable, very safe, that tends to work. And then there are some instances where they put uh, neonates on a low dose methadone. So very just tiny dose to kind of help them wean off of whatever substance they've been born addicted to. And that is it. So hopefully you guys learned something. Don't forget to comment, share, like, all that fun stuff that and I'll see you guys in the next episode.